Hi, I'm Rich Vogel. I'm a neurophysiologist from Nashville, Tennessee. I'm also co-founder and co-chair of the NAS section on intraoperative neurophysiological monitoring. We're here to talk about neural monitoring in intramedullary spinal cord tumors. And I am joined by my colleagues, and we'll just go down the row and introduce ourselves. Uh, my name is Shengfu Larry Lo. I'm the director of the Spine Tumor Program at North Valley Health. I'm Adam Doan. I'm from Chadsford, Pennsylvania, and I am the co-chair along with Rich. So, Larry, let me ask you a question. Yeah. So let's start with the why. Why do you use monitoring during these procedures? And right. the, the second part of that question is, how do you monitor them? So what modalities would you use? Got it. So I would argue that for an intramedullary spinal cord tumor resection, that the neural monitoring, it is the most critical element of the surgery because that guides whether the patient's undergoing neurological injury as they're doing the resection. And these cases are very high risk for neurological injury, as you know. In terms of the typical modalities that we use, obviously the standard motor uh, transcranial motor evolved potentials and somatosensory evolved potentials, but unique to the intramedullary spinal cord tumor surgery, we typically monitor either epidural or subdural D wave. And we typically also do dorsal column mapping if we have to make a myelotomy. Gotcha. Um, so in regards to those modalities, there's some, you know, lesions that are maybe easier to take out, such as something that's well circumscribed, like an ependymoma. Uh, then you have something like an astrocytoma where you have a little bit more of a, a, a blended boundary. Right. Does that change how you actually order those modalities or those are your modalities regardless? Those are my modalities regardless, but how I respond to the signaling from our IOM team. Uh, depends on the, uh, the histology quite fac uh, factors heavily into that. I would say that typically if the tumor comes right to the surface, then we might skip the dorsal column mapping because we'll just use that natural opening to start getting into the spinal cord. But oftentimes if we're having to do at least a midline myelotomy, then I think the dorsal column mapping is critical. Um, sometimes we'll do sort of a dress approach where we enter the tumor at the dorsal root entry mm -hmm. zone. And even the, in that scenario, I still do dorsal column mapping to make sure that I'm not missing it. Gotcha. Um, Rich, question for you. So D-waves versus MEPs, uh, can you kind of explain the difference from like the neuromonitoring perspective, maybe some of the, the limitations of each one of those? Sure. Without getting too technical, they're, they're essentially generated in the same way by stimulating the motor cortex. The difference between them ultimately is that the MEP is recorded from the muscle and the D wave is recorded from the dorsum of the spinal cord, as Larry said, either epidurally or subdurally. And the benefit of that, amongst other things, is that it's really um, not really impacted by anesthesia. So because there's no synapses in that in that track there, um, it's it's also the case that um, a, a D wave can be run continuously with very little movement, whereas a motor evoked potential, it causes movement. So you sort of have to do it periodically and you know pause the surgery and it can be a little bit invasive. Um, generally, motor evoked potentials will because there's a synapse there and because you're, you're working on the spinal cord, you may see changes in motor evoked potentials and yet the D wave is, is, is stable. And what that wave is ultimately is the, it's, it's, it's the engram of the function of the corticospinal tract. So the amplitude of it tells you how much of that tract is functioning. And ultimately while motors may change, the presence of the D wave can be very reassuring to the surgeon is, is what I've been told by surgeons. Has that been your experience as well? Absolutely. I think for a lot of these surgeries, especially if the tumor is infiltrating, um, very early on during the resection, we'll see a decline in the motor evolved potentials. And if we were really only reliant on the MEPs in terms of predicting neurological injury, then the surgery would stop there. Whereas most commonly what we see specific, uh, specific for larger tumors is that we early on in the case, particularly at the myelotomy, we lose the sensories or at least some element of the sensories. As we're doing the resection and getting the tumor anteriorly, the motor evolved potentials might start coming down, but the D waves are holding steady. And that's tremendously reassuring for the surgeon. And one of the challenges with D waves, Adam, is, as you know, is that there's a 
range within the spinal cord where you can record a D-wave, right? And mm -hmm. in, in the upper level, you may not be able to put an electrode above. And as you get lower down the spine around T10, there's um, no longer the ability to record a D-wave because the cortical spinal tract axons are, um, have sort of exited the spine along the way. Um, what are the challenges of in, in that context of recording a D wave, either when you're high up in the spine or even closer down toward the conus? Well, I mean, I think you said uh, a lot of it. So the, the challenges, and I'd be interested to hear how you guys do it, um, is you, you can put something more rostrally in that axis of control, and can, then your, your D wave that you're actually monitoring off of is placed caudally, and that's how you're making your decisions. So if you're up near, say, the, the cranial cervical junction, you're not going to be able to get anything rostrally, so you have to rely on the only the, the caudal one. I'm not sure um, if everybody actually does it that way. I think that in a perfect world, that makes sense, but now you're using two electrodes, which do have costs associated with them. Mm -hmm. So you can also put something just below the lesion, and then maybe if you don't get something at baseline, you can put something more rostrally just to see if that was technical error versus not. But yeah, once you get down low, say around like T10, T11, you run out of cortical spinal tracts. You you could, if you're trying to put it below the lesion, you might be more on the, the cardiac equina than anything else. And, um, you know, there's some extra modalities that you could run in those considerations because you won't have the D-wave at your disposal, perhaps. When, when you react to changes, um, you know, if you start to lose your motors and you have a good D-wave, or even if your D-wave starts to degrade a little bit, what are some of the strategies you do intraoperatively to see if you can like reverse that signal change? I think certainly the first thing that we do is to stop and take a breath, yeah. right? You certainly don't want to continue to plow through because your intraoperative physiology team is telling you that there's a problem. Um, the strategies that we typically take is to take a look at the blood pressures, making sure that there's adequate core perfusion. Um, typically, these patients would have already gotten some steroids up front, but we certainly would consider redosing a high-dose dexamethasone to see if we can sort of reverse some of the injury. Um, we want to make sure that it's not a technical error. So we do typically always place a rostral D-wave just to make sure that's not mm -hmm. a technical error when the D-wave on the uh, caudal side is starting to degrade. Um, and oftentimes, if we're catching early enough, that will reverse the changes. And I think that that's where... Um, that live feedback that you're talking about instead of having to pause and be like, please run an MEP is critical because oftentimes we are in the zone and we're doing the resection and we're not really thinking about, oh, it's been 10, 15 minutes since we la ran the last MEP. Mm -hmm. And so we're catching the damage after the fact. And that's even assuming that you have a reliable MEP at that point during the surgery. Um, and then uh, if you are getting a, this might be a question for both of you guys. If you are running a D wave and it starts to degrade, what's like a strategy to see whether or not that correlates with how the patient's actually doing? I think in terms of if you have, if you actually have reliable MEPs during, at that point during this surgery, I think running an MEP would be super helpful, right? right. And I think that sometimes um, we'll see the waveform start to degrade but then they'll still be good MEPs that I'm a little bit less likely to stop the surgery at that point, rather than a scenario where if the MEPs go down concurrently, I'm much more worried. I, I don't really have anything to add to that, actually. <laughs> yeah, I think the only other thing would be uh, to check the electrode because that's yeah. that's something else. I don't know how you guys like secure yeah. it in place, but that's yeah. always a, a challenge. And I've been in cases where it's probably had to been repositioned at least a couple of times. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you mentioned dorsal collar mapping. Uh, maybe a question for Rich. Um, you know, there's a few different ways I think historically that technique has been described. Is there a, a technique that you, you've used or that you, you think that, you know, maybe is the, the best one just for the, the general, you know, um, the, the, the general like neuromonitoring community to advocate for? Yeah, I mean, high level, there's, there's three techniques out there. One is stimulating the spinal cord and recording from the scalp, sort of like an SSCP. One is stimulating the spinal cord and recording uh, somewhere from the lower extremities, like the popliteal fossa. And a third one would be to stimulate the lower extremities and record from an electrode that is placed across the spinal cord. Um, 
I don't know if they make electrodes for that uh, in the U.S. anymore. They used to, but mm -hmm. don't know. Um, my preferred method is to stimulate the spinal cord and record the SSCP. And what you see is uh, when you stimulate on one side, you see a normal morphology and you can just call it like an up down morphology and you stimulate the other side and it inverts like a phase reversal. And in the middle with the dorsal median raphe, you'll see um, sort of a flat line. And that lets you know that there's a, um, a physiologically silent region that would be the best place to perform the myelotomy. Yeah. So that's my preferred method. And some of that is because of the, the phase cancellation. And yep. there, there was actually a paper that came out of Europe, which is probably why they still have that one electrode. And it compared the two techniques. And they find that uh, the both of them have about the same rate of success. But they advocated for just using a probe, doing the phase reversal, because it's cheaper, it's faster, and it's just less complex for everyone. How do you guys do it in your practice? We definitely do the direct spinal cord stimulation. Um, the problem is that when you're relying on dorsal column mapping, oftentimes the tumor geometry is eccentric mm -hmm. and the midline raphe may not actually be a straight line. Mm -hmm. So the way you lay that electrode is going to be problematic if you're not accounting for that. Whereas just using a stimulator probe to map it out segmentally is sort of much quicker and also accounts for the, uh, will allow for the fact to accommodate that unusual geometry. Have you ever changed what you were about to do because you thought it was the anatomic midline you stimulated and maybe it was off by a millimeter or two, so you went in from a different spot? Oh, all the time. All the time. I think that, like I said, in these larger tumors where it distorts, it rotates the spinal cord, it's hard to predict exactly that degree of rotation based off of looking at the spinal cord. Obviously, there's some clues, right? Typically, the vessels dive in in the midline. If the tumor is quite large, it might have actually even done the myelotomy for us. But oftentimes, the, um, the geometry is unusual. And as crazy as it sounds, it might not be quite as easy to find that perfect sweet spot to minimize the dorsal column dysfunction from the surgery. So that's where, like, if I'm going through core tissue at all to resect the tumor, I'm definitely not, I'm definitely doing dorsal column mapping. And even in scenarios where it comes to right to the surface, it's helpful to know that as well. Right. And um, have you seen that translate into better post-op sensory outcomes as a result of this technique? I definitely do. I think that um, for a substantially sized tumor, I always tell patients that they're going to have some degree of proprioceptive loss, at least transiently after surgery. And since we've adopted this technique, I find that, yes, they will still actually have a dorsal column, degree of dorsal column dysfunction after surgery, but I find it that a lot of those changes are reversible now. Which I guess is the, the benefit of some of the modalities we described, because even with D waves, it's more about the long term prognosis than it is about the immediate wake up. Absolutely. Well, I think we're at time. So, Rich, Larry, thank you very much for your time today. Thank, thank you. you very much.